Let's just find our way into a nice posture to sit for the next half an hour or so. We'll guide us through a meditation and then we'll emerge into a more, into a talking space, conversational space. But for now, let's just get still together. Inviting all the energies of heart and body to settle. Remembering that the settling is a natural a natural process, something that our systems, our constitutions know how to do. Even if they get stuck in revved up states for times, they still know how to do this returning. So it's without any force or demand that we just watch, observe, allow this natural process to take hold, to occur. And as the settling happens, you might notice that sensitivity is also developing. We become more sensitive to the activities of this body, the movement, the breath, We can see how natural it is that when there's this settling that sensitivity is also here and it's nothing to be feared. It also feels natural. Nothing to be afraid of. It's only the conceptual mind that gets afraid of sensitivity. It fears the unknown. But in real time, when we start to notice notice life that is unfolding right here in this body, in this heart, mind, body system. It only feels natural and right. You can feel how this breath is not ours. It's coming and going. It's 
both a receiving and a release. And every breath is different because the body is alive, dynamic. How beautiful and how mysterious it is that in the space of the sensitivity, we can learn something about process, not self. The body has its own nature, its own rhythm. The imperfections that we might see are really just perfect forces of nature. This wisdom, this knowing is revealed in its own time as well. Wisdom is also a force of nature. When the conditions are right, wisdom reveals, reveals truth. It's not something that we do or have to get. And just offer the supporting conditions. Just relaxing into the space of sensitivity. Remembering to feel the body. Remembering not to reject any experience. And if we remember to do these things again and again and again, there's no choice but for deep wisdom to follow. So we can just settle back Relax. And watch as sensitivity develops. 
and wisdom grows. We need not worry if our, we find our minds lost in thought, seduced by some planning thought or expression of doubt or storyline. You can be relaxed with this too. This is also not self, it's just activity of mind. Thought arising when the conditions are right. We can notice this beautiful process. The thinking is being known. Can I be relaxed and restful with this too? Watch thoughts come and go. No need to force or demand anything.
And opening your eyes whenever you're ready. Thanks for your practice, everyone. Take a minute to give the body a little love. It's okay to stand up if you wanna stand up or to move a bit. You can also take a minute just to notice that you're not alone. Surrounded by friends. Even people you don't know, friendly, friendly people trying to find some love and compassion and wisdom in our lives. Such a beautiful thing. 30 or more people show up every week to do this work together. Can we imagine if what it, our world would be like if thousands of people showed up every week to do some kind of spiritual work like this? Be nice to imagine. Is anybody here for the first time? If you are and you'd like to say hello, you can just unmute yourself, say your name, what pronouns you use if you'd like. So I have been um, sharing some reflections, reading through Listening to the Heart. Many of you know that, great book. And just to uh, Yeah, maybe I'll just open with a quote first. If you're following along, we're just jumping into chapter 10. This is the chapter called Contemplative Ease, co-authored by Tanisra and Kitasaro. And it opens with this quote from the Sharangama Sutra that um, they teach from quite a bit in this book. Why don't you listen to your own hearing nature? Hearing does not spontaneously arise. It is because of sound that hearing gets its name. But when hearing returns to its source, it is free of sound. What then does one call that which is set free? Let me read that one more time. Why don't you listen to your own hearing nature? Hearing does not spontaneously arise. It is because of sound that hearing gets its name. But when hearing returns to its source, it is free of sound. What then does one call that which is set free? It's a bit of a koan, isn't it? A beautiful description of this listening, listening to the heart. So I've just been really, you know, often when there's a some kind of confusion in the mind or the mind is learning something that's not totally clear, it can be um, useful just to kind of return to some simplicity. Like what does it mean to listen? What does it really mean to listen? And so in doing this, I've just been kind of curious about this intuitive awareness that can emerge from the space of awareness, really. And listening to our own heart, listening to what's moving here, listening to the body, listening to what's moving here with the body, the sensations, what are we learning by listening? being with the sensations, watching them come and watching them go in these really simple ways. And 
And no teaching is complete without a dog story. So <laughs> my beloved little Sasha, just been listening to her and the last couple of days I've been busy is not the right word, but really in a contemplative space. And so although I've been doing the normal things, going for walks, taking her for walks, take, responding to her needs when I understand what she's asking for, to go outside, to eat, doing the you know regular petting at the regular times that she expects it, or bed, right when we get up, things like this. She's been a bit restless and I didn't notice that until today. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. Practicing listening and noting that, noticing that this companion, this four-legged creature that I'm energetically connected to is restless. And also it dawned on me that she is coming to get me for things at a greater frequency, which is what tuned me into the fact that I think she's restless. I don't know what that means, but it's just the word I'm giving to this energy sense and you know the request that she's making coming into my office, asking for, asking to go outside or whatever she's asking for. And I was curious about the quality of my attention and this relationship to restlessness in this animal. But it was interesting. What was interesting is that this, this listening that emerged with this noticing like, oh, this animal is restless and how easy it was to really care about that. Like, oh, I wonder if it has something to do with the quality of my attention. Not being, not being here, but not being really here. You know what that's like to kind of go through the motions and do all the things, but really not be interested or alive with the activities. And truthfully, we spend so much of our time this way, don't we? I mean, how many of us are really with our toothbrushing activity every time we do it or drinking water activity or putting on our clothes activity or not hurrying through washing the body or moving about our house. We can just be on autopilot with these things. But when there's a, an awareness or a, a leaning into this natural capacity to care that's often associated right here in the middle of our daily life activities when we're mindful of how we're moving and what we're doing, that compassion naturally arises. Like, oh, I care. I really care about this life. I care about this dynamic interrelated existence between two creatures, a human and a dog, a human and another human. And how there's something really beautiful about that interconnection and what it yields. That it's, it's really never quite the same moment by moment, day by day. It is its own force of nature. And so listening to the quality of our attention can really even shine the light on this this really deep truth that this relationship is a force of nature. And perhaps there's more to learn and about nature, conditions, not self, not taking things personally, understanding the body as a force of nature, for example. Even as we brush our teeth or put on our clothes. So in this chapter of contemplative ease, the Kitty Sorrow and Tanisara kind of go through some storytelling to paint a picture for us about what it means to listen. And there's beautiful stories of, of their journey together and travels and decision to get married and traveled to Thailand and then, you know, all these places where they had to 
or chose to really respond to the dynamic force of nature in the midst of their lives. Like taking some time to pray and then walking down the street to only find that, to find that a house is on fire and there was a person that needed some care or to decide to do some retreat in South Africa later named Dharmagiri and then to be faced with hurricane kind of winds and then fires that drove them away. And each move, each time they encountered some difficulty, it was you know, in some ways met as the reality you know, of the experience, which is like, oh, this is a force of nature. It requires my full alive presence to decide what happens next. And in some ways, that's all we can do with our lives is feel into like, oh, wow, this is, this is life happening right here. I don't want to go on autopilot because life is really making itself known right now. And if I listen carefully, then I'll understand how that's impacting me and I'll feel alive in the midst of my activities, in the midst of my work, with my colleagues my partner, with my dog, with my friends, in our communities, in our activism, in whatever else that we're engaged in. And so feeling alive is this willingness to accept the dynamic nature of life, that everything is changing. And we have this possibility of participating skillfully if we can both accept that as reality and be willing to flow with things as they are, which is kind of everything, isn't it? <laughs> but so not easy. I mean, isn't that like at the, at the core of what we're doing as spiritual practitioners? learning how to have some ease, some acceptance, like I wanna find some way to stay balanced in the midst of the winds of life and stay really awake to all that's moving and all that I can learn and not negate any moment because every moment is a possibility of learning something in. So if I go on autopilot and just do the things that are needed in my life, I'm not really alive. I'm not really in relationship with the people I wanna be in relationship with. So some of the territory that we've covered over the last few weeks, we've explored this teaching on emptiness and explored the, deep, the, deep, the deepest teachings on Nibbana together the deepest kind of letting go, the deepest kind of acceptance of this dynamic nature of living, that everything is in a state of flux and we are all forces of nature, our bodies, our hearts. And understanding this deeply really helps us let go of this perception that there is somebody in charge of what's happening. Like, oh, it's not a Shelley who's orchestrating everything. This is all of this that I might consider to be a Shelley is all a set of processes that can be understood. And then we start to see this misperception that's there. And so we start to learn through these deep teachings that when the mind isn't preoccupied with self-concerns, when the mind has a different orientation to life, tonight I'm ca calling that this dynamic alive aliveness, that there's more room to revere all of life. There's more room for reverence.
and reverence even for life's processes. And so it seems paradoxical sometimes to think that emptiness or these deep teachings, emptiness and compassion are so closely connected because it has been my experience that when the mind, when this heart learns to really not things, not take things personally, and not personalize everything, that there is more room to feel into the depth of our experience. Like our oh, thoughts are just thoughts, feelings are just feelings. The body has a dynamic life of its own that I'm not necessarily in charge of. And when that happens, when this heart can really grok that, then there's nothing to do but to care. Oh. It's hard. Right, so that sometimes the heart just breaks like, oh, sweetie, so much clinging, so much craving, so much wanting, 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 not wanting. And yet in a moment when that ceases, like, oh gosh, that was really painful, right? It's nothing to do but have compassion. And that can be a very useful, a useful noticing, a useful perception to bring with us into our relationships. Because if it can be known here, it can be known there, right? It's more difficult to condemn, to hate, to hold someone else in contempt. When we see each other as forces of nature with this dynamic, alive capacity that we forget. Like I'm a committed practitioner and yet I, I forgot and I forget a lot. <laughs> and so perhaps if I can, you know, hold my own developing fragile meditator skills lightly, then I can hold each other with the same, hold other people with the same kind of care. Like, oh, look at us all, wild and often forgetting, not remembering that we are all forces of nature, bumping around, making mistakes, injuring each other, causing problems, leaving beauty behind, you know, all of it, it's just everything. There's a, a little quote inside the office at Insight Meditation Society. Joseph Goldstein likes to, um, has given many talks on this, the topic of um, emptiness and compassion. And has said that when compassion and emptiness are both present, enlightenment is unavoidable as a reminder for us all. So when we can learn to both remember to not hold back and understanding some of the deepest truths like everything is in a state of flow, life is dynamic. It's not personal, but it feels that way, but it's not. And in some moments we understand that. Then the heart cares and as that knowing that understanding deepens, then there's no, there's no limit. There's no limit to the freedom that can be experienced there. In this talk that Joseph gives, he often quotes um, Shabkar, who said that the mind is intrinsically empty naturally radiant and ceaselessly responsive. Intrinsically empty, 
naturally radiant and ceaselessly responsive to the compassion right there. Ceaselessly responsive, always willing to care. One of my teachers and one of many of our teachers in this room, Kamala Masters often says something like this reminder that when you pull one thread of the Dharma, they all come with. It all the teachings come forward. And so if it feels confusing, you know, that's okay to sort of drop the conceptual mind and to go for what's simple, to look for the thread that feels accessible and sometimes when this mind kind of gets confused, then I go back to this teaching on the five spiritual faculties as a way of understanding what is happening here, this process of learning, and which includes learning how to see experience as a force of nature, to see, to feel into life as a force of nature. And as the mind gets good at this, then we all learn that we don't have to be afraid of sensitivity. We don't have to be afraid of development. So there are these natural virtues or natural forces that are that propel the mind forward in life and and in meditation so these are more of like not not things that we do but these five spiritual faculties are conditions that we support so that our practice has the juice, right? So that our lives have the juice that it needs to keep going, to keep learning. And so in the, the teachings, these five spiritual faculties, <clears throat> when developed, when strengthened, become five great powers, right? The power to support the deepest understanding. And they might be known or thought of as powers because they were they were named after um, after a god in ancient India, a, a controlling kind of god. And so we might think about these five spiritual powers, faculties, forces that, when strengthened, become powers as more of influence. Maybe not control, but of influence. I mean, if control works for you, you can use it, but it often has some negative connotations for some of us. So we can think about influencing factors. So the first, the first of these five is faith or confidence, sada is the Pali word. So that which wants to practice is faith or confidence. It can be really simple, not, not, not much more than that. It could be this beautiful intention that to sit because we think there might be some value in this or to wanna to understand mindfulness and to explore mindfulness because we think there might be some value in it. So it doesn't even have to be a lot of confidence, but just a seed of confidence, just a little bit of huh, interest and wonder like, is this, possible? Is there some good here? And then the next is energy or virya or effort can be sometimes another way to describe this energy, this virtue. Effort or persevering energy. That which is practicing is virya. And again, it can be simple. So the effort it takes to be aware, for example, is what we mean often 
we're over efforting, trying too hard, trying to get somewhere. And then that's that energy that's met with, or the effort to be aware is met with the energy of greed, right? To want to get somewhere, to want to become someone, to want to be better at something. And then the third spiritual faculty is mindfulness. So this bit of confidence that we might have to practice, to do something good with our lives, then leads to us making some effort towards that. And then we start to make some effort towards that, we decide to wake up, right? We decide to pay attention, to listen, to look. Okay, what am I doing here? So mindfulness or sati, that which happens is sati. So mindfulness to remember to recognize the present moment's experience. And we can simply call mindfulness awareness. Sometimes that word mindfulness gets confused with something that we do, but it's really not something that we do. It's a, compa it's a capacity that's innate that can be strengthened. It's not something that we do. It's a capacity that arises when faith and energy have paved the way. And then when mindfulness, as mindfulness gets stronger, and we remember more and more often to be aware, to pay attention, to notice, to listen. The natu this natural settling happens and we become more mindful in our lives, right? There's more presence. And you can notice this in your sitting practice. One moment of mindfulness, then seeds the next, then conditions the next. It may seem like our minds are all over the place, but if there's been a moment of mindfulness, it actually makes it more possible to be mindful in the next moment. And so it's true, there might be a force of uh, delusion that sweeps the mind away and we're lost in thought, but then something, something remembers, right? To pay attention again, to look, to listen again. Ah, and then there we are. So we can't say the previous mind moment of mindfulness was for nothing, even if the mind got swept away, right? Because just like it's not ir insignificant just because some embarrassing amount of time had gone by before I realized that my beloved little four-legged was restless. It's not insignificant that there was a moment when this heart remembered to listen again. And I, we really want to tune into that because we want to recognize that this is a legacy. We're planting a seed that will leave a beneficial legacy that will seed the next moment of mindfulness. And so concentration is what naturally follows mindfulness. Samadhi actually is what follows mindfulness. And samadhi can sometimes be thought of as this one pointed awareness where the mind is returning to an experience again and again and develops understanding by exploring that like the breath or something like that. But it can also be this continuity of awareness. So the continuity of many, many moments of mindfulness, continuity, mindfulness strung together by many moments, right? And it's something that we can take with us in our daily lives in this way. Continuity of awareness, a commitment to living a mindful life, an interest in that moment when there, when it's when it was possible, when it is possible for us to listen, for us to realize something. Oh, interconnected! Look at this. Oh, dynamic. Life is dynamic right here. Ah, oh, this doesn't really feel like self, or this feels so much like self, right? doesn't feel like a force of nature. This body really feels like it's mine right now, right? All of those beautiful moments that we remember to be awake are really important. And with this continuity of awareness, we can learn that to have space even around that which feels unpleasant, right? Even if, wow, I remember you know, being on retreat a couple of years ago and it was like every step I took during this walking meditation 
period, it felt like Shelly was taking that step. And it was kind of impressive. <laughs> like, wow, this is like Shelly is really the pretty firm perception of Shelly that's here. And what's interesting is that that even when though that's wrong view, like we learn that Shelly is just a shortcut that this mind makes when it misperceives a whole lot of processes at play or forgets to notice, right? When there's a breach of mindfulness, it might not be the right word, what happens when there's an absence of something, not a breach of it, but you know, you get the picture. <laughs> So what happens when mindfulness is not there is that this mind takes a shortcut, right? And makes an easy, an easy to believe uh, resolve. Like, oh, this must be a Shelly that's here. Forgets that, oh, there's just the eyes doing what eyes do and this whole dynamic, you know, force of nature inside this body that like, you know, is happening and, the ears are doing what the ears do and the mind is doing when all of this is informed by a moment previous and all of this informs the next moment. And, you know, somehow this whole construction of Shelley negates all of that. It's like a quick route to like, I get this. I know what's happening here. This is body and it's yours and your name is Shelley. And that's what we're going to go with, right? And so even when we notice that, it's still a beautiful moment because wisdom is what notices that. So when mindfulness is strengthened by remembering again and again and again through this and this continuity develops, then there's no other, there's no other possible result except for wisdom to arise. So even if I'm, this mind is, misperceiving like no knowing that it's misperceiving but being really honest about that like oh this is Shelly look at that this feels like Shelly this feels like Shelly noting that again and again and again wisdom knows that and is only possible to know that because of all of the practice that has preceded that all of the moments of mindfulness and so this wisdom is not so much a, a memory like of intellectual understanding, but a deep in, insight that emerges from the depth of our own hearts, from the depth of practice and can be available to us. You know, I used an example of being on retreat, but right here in the middle of our daily lives. Like in a simple example, like, oh, sweetie, you forgot that you were this little four-legged creature is depending on you. You forgot that you belong to her. You forgot that this relationship was alive. It's not just a, a routine. And so then wisdom actually strengthens faith. So when we start to learn about life and you know what is this kind of existence that we're doing here? This question that we might we might consider as part of our Buddhist practice, like that deep question like, well what is this? This life, this mind, this construction and this relationship business. So we can, when we start to learn, start to listen to what emerge in the form of an answer, then that only strength and, and it makes sense, right? It starts to make sense. In some moments we actually see like, oh, impermanence, life is dynamic. Things are changing. I know that because I can tune into the seasons or I was just full of anger and now it's anger is no long is no uh, anywhere to be found or I was just crying and now I'm laughing like wow look at things change and that only strengthens this 
deeper listening. Oh, let's, let's listen some more. Let's see what that, let's see if there's a deeper response to that inquiry. What is this? What is this? Or we start to see that when we decide to take up mindfulness practice that our lives work a bit better. Maybe our friends report that we're a little more patient or happier. Or maybe we feel, we don't necessarily feel all of that. We feel sensitive and the unpleasantness, but, oh, but we have some capacity to be with that. Or maybe we don't have to turn away so much from the pain of the world, from all the problems in the world. And that's a beautiful thing too. So it's not just, you know, whether we have deep samadhi in our 30 minute meditation, but we have to take a broad view. Like, oh, what is this? How is practice benefiting my life? How is it benefiting my relationships? How is it benefiting? Or is there more capacity? Perhaps we don't have to use this one skill of avoiding everything that's unpleasant or being completely dependent on seeking pleasant uh, experience outside of ourselves for our happiness. Perhaps we start to feel some contentedness with the conditions, even when there's sadness, even when there's grief, even when we feel like things aren't going the way that we want them to go, even when we notice unpleasant noticings like, wow, you've been absent a lot, kind of going through the emotions, not really available. That's kind of sad, but wait, the heart's awake for that. What a beautiful thing. And so this engine, the five spiritual faculties is like a beautiful engine. Beginning with faith and then faith inspires energy or effort and energy inspires looking, listening. It's listening, what is the next right thing? Ah, oh, practice, in some way practice. And this willingness to remember that we care about this life and that we're gonna look and listen then leads to more moments like this and we develop this ability of presence, this capacity of presence, samadhi, this deep. And actually the mind, samadhi, we might describe it as like a quieting of the mind. And so one expression of that could be a quieting of thoughts, like less, fewer thoughts, or they're kind of in the background, not in the foreground. We might notice thoughts coming and going, but not really attached, not really jumping on the jumping on the train, but just watching the train wander by. Right? Or there might be this quieting that happens as when thoughts aren't resisted. When we just accept that the activity of the mind is like this. And we find a way to relax with that. Now that's really beautiful. That's really supportive because that relaxation then supports deeper presence. And we know that when there's continuity of awareness, then wisdom naturally follows. And then when wisdom when we notice wisdom, then that just generates more faith. Like, oh, there's, let's go do some more looking. Let's see how deep this care can go. Let's check out. It's Buddha said that this ability to care, be kind is boundless. Really? What about now? Is it possible under these conditions when it seems impossible? And so we can, it, it can often feel like, you know, we're just, we're having to, to, meditation can sometimes feel like a project or our spiritual lives can feel like they're a project. Like we need to somehow resolve a predicament. And instead we're trying to relax that idea 
or those ideas and really see this renewing benefit of practice in all of our lives and the decisions that we make and the way we live our lives. So it's not so much about being a doer, like someone who has to do something, like another activity, like we can't forget to brush our teeth, we can't forget to do our practice, we can't forget to eat, we can't forget to exercise, we can't forget to call three friends, we can't, you know, everything. So like, oh, one more thing that leads to an autopilot. But if we remember that we are in dynamic and renewing relationship with our life and all the activities, then practice starts to do us. And we, there's, there, with this listening that we're doing, then we can start to feel this relaxation and space for more. There is space for compassion. Right? So understanding the engine that propels our life forward, the five spiritual faculties, is one way of learning how to relax and not think, take things too personally. And if we can relax and not take things so personally, personally, then perhaps there's space for a deeper care. Like, oh, I don't have to, I don't have to work so hard. I can just understand something and see if that understanding then has an impact on my life. towards the end of chapter 10. And he's, uh, Kitty Saro and Tanissa are really using the Kuan Yin teachings to illustrate what they mean about listening. Really not using, that's probably not the proper way to say that because actually their deep insights that they share with us in this book actually came from their practicing of and learning through the teachings of Kuan Yin. Uh, the Bodhisattva of compassion, the embodiment of compassion. It says, and, the, and this is a bit long, but it's, they're such beautiful storytellers that sometimes it's nice just to read a little section from the book and um, let it speak for itself. So I just like to do that. In the Sharangama Sutra, Kuan Yin reveals her enlightenment through contemplating sound and returning the hearing until all distinctions dissolve. Suddenly I transcended the mundane and transcendental worlds and through the 10 directions, a perfect brightness prevailed. I obtained two supreme states. First, I was united with the fundamental, wonderfully enlightened mind of all the Buddhas of the 10 directions and I gained a strength of compassion equal to that of all the Buddhas. Second, I was united below with all living beings and the six paths, and I gained a kind regard for all living beings equally. I just love that quote, the way this, depth of uh, transcending the mundane and realizing some depth you know, the depth of awareness there and this connection with compassion. Kuan Yin re reveals the secret from which springs her inconceivable powers of response, ceaselessly responsive, as Joseph said. Who exactly is Kuan Yin? Kuan Yin is not Eastern or Western, male or female. The accomplishments of bodhisattvas and realized beings represent our deepest nature our true heart. They are not beings of the past, but beings of the future who demonstrate our potential. Master Hua, who introduced us to the Kuan Yin Dharmas, used a lot of humor in his teaching. There is a practice that is popular with devotees of Kuan Yin, reciting her name over and over, Namo Kuan Shur Yin Pusa. 
This means I return my life to the one who listens to the sounds of the world at ease. This mantra is a concentration practice which protects the mind. It is also a faith-based practice calling on Kuan Yin's merciful response. If you can't say Kuan Yin's name, say your own name. When you know who you truly are, you will meet Kuan Yin. Master Hua's teaching often followed in the paradoxical style, which at every turn both postulate the very true, wonderful nature of reality and then set about deconstructing the very premise. In the end, it really leaves us nowhere to stand other than in simple awe of the indescribable mystery. True emptiness does not obstruct wonderful existence. Wonderful existence does not obstruct true emptiness. True emptiness isn't empty. Wonderful existence doesn't exist. Because true emptiness isn't empty, it is therefore called wonderful existence. Wonderful existence doesn't exist, and so it's called true emptiness. Master of Law. Wonderful existence and true emptiness are not opposed. But when you pull a thread of one, the other comes with. When you tug on compassion, you feel the teachings on emptiness. And when you tug on emptiness, he naturally opens the heart to a reverence for life that is compassion. Thanks for your kind attention, everyone. There's a little bit of time left if you have any questions or reflections, contributions to the conversation. You don't have to know anything. You can just have something to say. Yeah, what a relief to not have to be wise, but to trust the arising of wisdom when the conditions are right. What a relief that is. Doesn't it feel like a relief to you guys too? Not have to be somehow a realized person. Maybe it's just me. Maybe you're all realized. I'll keep working on it. Well, I have an idea that maybe we would do a little Kuan Yin chanting. What do you think? Games? <laughs> okay. So you have to promise not to um, expect me to have any kind of vocal skill. Promise? <laughs> okay. So if we keep ourselves muted, this should work. And you can just chant there in your little zoom screen you all hear me and you'll hear yourself too and it won't sound like weird zoom activity it'll just hopefully sound normalish so the it's just the simple quan quan chanting that um, namo quan shuri and pusa right? and this is just bringing forth the energy of compassion into our lives returning our lives to the listening Right, with care. So I'll start and then it'll just loop, repeat itself for a couple of minutes and then we'll end. We'll know when we'll end. It'll actually end, I'll do a couple of rounds of humming of this chant. This really can be skillful to give our minds, our thinking minds, something good to do with its time. Right, their minds are going to think anyway. Sometimes if I notice my mind is like, kind of going off in places that are that helpful, a lot of doubt or something, fear, then I'll give give it like a mantra to to chew on. So Namo Kwan Shri and Pusa is one of those. Namo Kwan Shri and Pusa Namo Kwan Shri and Pusa Namo 
不挂绝也不杂纳，不挂绝也不杂纳，不挂绝也不杂纳，不挂绝也不杂纳。不挂绝也不散呐，不挂绝也不散呐，不挂绝也不散呐，不挂绝也不散呐，不挂绝也。不散呐，不挂绝也；不散呐，嗯And just like that, we're at nine o'clock. So we'll consider that our offering of merit tonight. Thanks for being here.